Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Tikkun El Shavuot. Hi, Eitan. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. My name is Isaac Zablocki. I am the director of the Israel Film Center at the Marlene Myers and JCC Manhattan. We are very excited to have you here at our annual Tikkun El Shavuot. Usually there's free cheesecake. Um, tonight you got to supply your own cheesecake. Um, but we're here all night with amazing programs as we are every year. And uh, we're excited to make you a part. We're excited to have you in person very soon. Um, and um, it's, it's, of course, always an exciting night. And we mix traditional study with um, from, from the very beginning of this program, which I, I think is probably in its like 17th year now. Um, we've been mixing traditional study with culture. And um, part of the, the, the strong components of culture have always been Israel and film. And I think there's nobody better to represent Israeli film than one of Israel's um, um, leading and I'd say also pioneering filmmakers, Eitan Fox, who's with us tonight. Eitan, thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Eitan, I'll your sound. It yeah, it is morning uh, here, 6.30 a.m. Um, can you hear me? We hear you well. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so I'm I'm okay as far as um, one can be okay in Israel nowadays. It was the first night in since Tuesday, I believe, where there were no uh, missiles fired at Tel Aviv. So I had a, a good night's sleep. Um, so I'm I'm okay to talk to you about or be part of your Tikkun Lel Shavuot. Very exciting. Um, I think I've never been to Tikkun Lel Shavuot. So maybe once in my um, um, teenage years. So this is wonderful. And thank you for um, having me. We're actually based on one from Tel Aviv. Do you know um, the Alma Tikkun Shavuot in Tel Aviv? Yes, yes. So and that, I... that, that is actually the Tikkun that started ours. And um, if you were in New York right now, you'd be in a building that's packed with people all night long. And I've been to Shavuot in Tel Aviv, which also turns into a whole white night uh, party. And it's, it's always an exciting event there too. Um, I know that we're, next we're, year, we're next year, Aviv. yeah, next year we'll have um, an event uh, at the JCC in New York, and I hope I can be there in person. Um, yeah, 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 that'll be the right way to do it. And thank you for starting off actually by talking about um, the situation that's going on right now in Tel Aviv. And of course, uh, you have your feet on the ground there, and um, we're all concerned, and I, I think um, hope for a very peaceful and quick. Um, resolution to this all. How how is everyone doing there? Um, uh, uh, you know, war is is pretty terrible, <laughs> to say the least. It's really this is um really sad, tragic. I would say on on so many levels. Um, but I'd rather um use this tikkun lel shavuot for um um somewhat of an escapist experience for myself and not talk too much about um, um, our situation here in Israel. I'm sure we will get there. Um, some of my films are more overtly um, political. And so I guess we will get there, reach there at some point, but I'll try to, you know, um, um, try to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> but no, it's really a very complicated, um, sad situation. I, I, I completely understand. And yes, um, escapism is one of the um, wonderful elements of film, um, uh, though, though, yes, we might get into it directly um, with the themes of your films and, and I'm sure it will play out. And, um, and, and thank you for, for being here. And I'm glad you had a full night's sleep. We will not have that, but. Uh, <laughs> very um, good, for very good reasons in your case, yeah, for very good reasons. Better reasons for sure, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, I, I want to start with just a little bit of uh, background for those who are not completely familiar with um, Eitan's work. And I'm hoping everybody here in this room has had an opportunity at some point to see one of um, Eitan's films, at least, if not all of them. Um, and um, really talk about just the significance um, from the beginning of, of what you represent. I mean, of course, Israel is experiencing 
what some call a renaissance. Uh, renaissance is a rebirth. I don't know if it's a rebirth or a, an actual birth, a first time. A, Israel, Israel's film industry has really become um, one of the powers to contend with internationally. And, um, and I, I, I will say, uh, not just to flatter you, but uh, in all honestly, honesty, that, um, that you have really paved this way and I personally have been following your career. I grew up in Israel um, and have been following your career since the 90s when it was not as popular to be a filmmaker um, and definitely not an Israeli filmmaker. And um, you really broke through in many ways. Um, and and um, the ni I, I feel like the 90s was a period where um, Israel was trying to find its voice a little bit um, in, in, in terms of cinema. And there weren't a lot of new young voices coming in at first, and yours was one of them. And then, of course, once we hit uh, the 2000s, you really, I think, even led the way internationally. So I want to kind of um, explore before we get into to your recent work, which um, which is also fascinating. And and I, I guess I'll give the plug now that Sublet, and I'll plug it a few more times, but Eitan's latest film, Sublet, is coming out um, next month. We are actually going to be presenting it. We're going to be one of the presenting organizations um, um, and have a um, rooftop screening of it during its release, um, which is, I think, a nice way to do it. But um, uh, for those of you who can't um, um, visit Tel Aviv, uh, Sublet is uh, the next closest way to do this. Um, but we'll get back more into detail in Sublet, but let's just start from the beginning, Eitan. Um, tell us about your background. Your English is impeccable. Um, and um, tell us a little bit about your background and what made you get into film. So let me start with my English. I think it's not impeccable. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm better in Hebrew. And um, I many, many times when I speak English, I feel that I'm missing the right words. This was in Hebrew. I'd be maybe more exact, more precise, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to do this in English. Of course, I'll do this in English. My parents were American. We spoke English at home. Um, I was born in um, the Upper West Side in Manhattan, and my parents made Aliyah, moved to Israel in 1967. Um, my parents and their three sons, uh, we moved to Jerusalem, 1967. I grew up in Jerusalem. Um, I went to school, high school, joined the army in 1982. After I, I did my army service, I went to study film and television in Tel Aviv University and have been an Israeli film director and television director ever since. So, um, yes. And, and it's fascinating to me, um, you, you we brought up Tel Aviv already a few times and that plays a huge role in your work um, and and I and it's interesting to me that you grew up in Jerusalem. I actually did not know that till I was reading your bio, reviewing your bio. I guess to review, maybe I did, maybe I did know. But Tel Aviv is so essential to your work. I I put it, um, I think, and we'll explore this also more in depth. I think as we go through, but um, I, I put it that the um, that. I'd say Tel Aviv in your work would, is similar to New York and Woody Allen's work and um, really is a character in your films um, uh, leading up to even your most recent film. Um, do you ever consider exploring Jerusalem? Is there a separation there? A few of my earlier um, works, especially television, maybe Florentine, my TV show from the mid nineties that I think we'll talk about later on. Uh, were actually about um, the differences, the connection, the tension between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. So um, I have Jerusalem in me. I grew up in Jerusalem, uh, but I moved to Tel Aviv after my army service and have been here ever since. I've become a big patriot of Tel Aviv. I love Tel Aviv with all my heart and soul. I think it's the best city in the world. <laughs> and I, 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 I can't see myself living any else, anywhere else. Uh, I think Tel Aviv is, is um, the good part of Israel. Tel Aviv represents everything that's good about Israel. So, um, and I'm happy that Sublet, which as you said, is opening in theaters in the States in early June, uh, can supply people with, uh, with this experience of actually traveling to, traveling to Tel Aviv in a year or in a period where no one can travel anywhere. 
Um, so, and I don't want to sound too sentimental or, or too corny, but films do allow us to travel. <laughs> and, um, and, and yeah, Sublet's a film about a New York Times um, travel writer who um, uh, decides to come to Tel Aviv and write a piece about Tel Aviv. And the whole film is about a relationship that um, um, starts and evolves between this man, this 50 something year old um, um, correspondent or journalist for, for New York Times with Tel Aviv and, and how he learns to know Tel Aviv, love Tel Aviv. And I'd say even comes with a little bit of comparison between American culture and what, what signifies Tel Aviv. Um, and we'll get into Sublet a little bit more, but now let's start, I want to start with your first film. Your first feature film, you, you had made a short film out of film school um, relating to one of the themes you've explored, which is um, military and machoism, um, all kind of with the umbrella of homosexuality, sometimes playing a part in some of your films. But I'm going to dive into your first feature film, making a feature film. This was uh, Shirata Sirena, The um, uh, Sound of the Siren. Song of the Siren. The Song of the Siren. Thank you. Uh, Song of the Siren. Thailand English, yeah. Yeah, which unfortunately plays a, th this was one that I was thinking about, plays a little bit of a theme, uh, a connecting theme right now, the song of the siren referring to um, the sirens of war. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Um, and it also, and it also has a very um, um, interesting, um, fun um, connection to our reality uh, today. It stars um, uh, I, I, at the time a young uh, model actor called Yair Lapid, who is um, uh, an important politician in Israel, um, uh, the head of a, a party called Yesh Atid. There is a future, and there's a question about that in Israel, but who hopefully um, will be um, at some point, maybe even now, but at some point, um, 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 building a coalition, building the, the government in Israel and being our prime minister. So he was the star of Song of the Siren, which is a film, a comedy, um, mind you, about um, Tel Aviv during uh, war time, uh, during the Gulf War. Things have not changed dramatically as you, as you um, can see nowadays. It's about a, a woman who, um, is between four different relationships, four different men in her life. And all this is happening while there are missiles um, fired at Tel Aviv during the Gulf War. And while she is sipping her espresso or drinking her cocktail, she, there are sirens that are heard and she has to run down to the bomb, bomb shelter and figure out her life and her love life, her sex life, her life in general, while this is happening. So even when I, um, my first film, um, 1994, if I'm not mistaken, a comedy, a romantic comedy could not escape war when it came to, you know, Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, definitely is a little eerie today. And uh, the having the ear lapid element to it, I'm sure, I'm sure um, uh, did not help him in his um, election attempts. Or maybe it did. Do people keep referencing back to the film and showing these clips of him uh, as, a, as a young actor model <laughs> before yeah. he was uh, a significant politician? Yeah, and this is probably going to ruin, um, ruin his, his attempts to, to form a coalition and become um, our next prime minister which is for us in Tel Aviv, a big a tragedy, I would say. Yeah, yeah no, it, uh, I, I could imagine that playing, playing the role and I re recognize the importance of it, especially right now. Um, from there, um, uh, I, I wanna highlight your work. You've, you, did, you did a few other films, but I wanted to highlight um, your work on uh, the show that I mentioned before, Florentine, we've mentioned. Um, Florentine was a ground, it, people talk now, even here in America about Israeli television. And um, if I could think back at a point that Israeli television changed um, and, or started to change um, from being, being a pretty, pretty simple industry <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. Simple, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I can think of other um, um, words, but simple is okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Korvim Korvim is the only other show that comes to mind 
before that. And uh, this was like a sitcom, uh, a very basic sitcom. But um, Florentine really, I think, changed um, the Israeli television industry um, as an original TV series that was, I think, original and just took the spices and flavors of the local space and, and um, you know, created an internationally, um, an international production that was so original and so fresh. Like, honestly, I can't compare it to any American show. I mean, there, there are shows out there today. Sometimes Israel, Israeli television gets a little American today, which is unfortunate. Um, Florentine was really its own experience that was ahead of its time. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about what, uh, what inspired Florentine and, um, and the making of it at the time when the Israeli film industry or television industry was pretty much non-existent? Yeah, yes. First of all, um, I want to refer to that, um, to the, the simple television comment. You have to understand, I, I grew up, we grew up uh, with only one channel in Israel. Till the early 90s, there was only one channel, the first channel, the public public TV, um, black and white till a certain point. Where I, I, when I was a kid, the only channel, black and white. We used to, they used to bring over um, American shows, but we used to see them in black and white. Like I saw the Brady Bunch, Partridge Family in black and white. Um, and then uh, we started, they, they started a second commercial channel in the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken. And then the people who ran um, the, uh, that channel came to me. This was after Song of the Shimon, that was the, uh, the biggest commercial success in 1994. Uh, and my first film, um, Time Off, my first, my graduation film from Tel Aviv University was very different, personal, um, about themes that I will be, you know, will be reoccurring in my, in my work. Song of the Simon was more of a kind of commercial film, a genre, romantic comedy and so on. So they came to me and said, we want you to do something which will somehow combine your personal stuff um, with um, your commercial abilities. Uh, and, and, and when we were talking more seriously, they said, we want to redefine young Israel. Um, I said that, they said whatever. Um, because I, one of the things I said, and people there said that they couldn't find themselves, the younger people could not find themselves represented in Israeli TV. And they said, let's try to um, fix that. Let's try to redefine young Israel in the mid nineties. Uh, so I, I did my best to do that. I was at the time young Israel. I was still young Israel at the time. And um, so I got, I got a group of young, um, television people, artists, and we developed this show, wrote it, directed it, casted it with cast it with the most wonderful group of young actors. They were all unknown and uh, became um, very um, prominent actors and and creators of television in Israel. Uh, I, to mention a few, Ayelet Zorer, who before Gal Gadot was our big um, success, Hollywood success. Um, uh, a, a woman called Dana Mudan, a wonderful film creator who's done wonderful stuff at TV shows here in Israel. Yeah, wonderful people that we got together and we tried to represent young Israel. I would say young um, Tel Aviv more than young Israel uh, as best as we could. And it did become a very big success in Israel. And young people were sitting in groups I know today in different parts of the country, watching this show, recognizing themselves or dreaming about becoming those people in Tel Aviv, moving to Tel Aviv, the wonderful city of Tel Aviv and, and becoming those people, becoming Tel Avivian, becoming part of the new Israel, so to speak. Uh, yeah. and, and what was nice is the film that the show was shown in many film festivals worldwide, especially Jewish film festival, LGBT film festivals. Um, it was before the time that yeah, um, American networks or streaming platforms were looking to Israel to find new shows to, to screen. Uh, th at the time, no one would show uh, a TV show um, in Hebrew with subtitles, uh, which is a thing that happens today or, or shows, Israeli shows are bought for American remakes. So, but that it was a wonderful experience. I remember like I screening in, in the Castro, in the Castro Theater in San Francisco, 1,500 seats full of, of Americans, of um, um, San Franciscoans. 
uh, watching six episodes of Florentine uh, and, and really identifying, enjoying it. That was a wonderful experience for me, the communicating maybe for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, with American audiences and feeling that I can do that. I can communicate um, Tel Aviv, Israel to audiences uh, worldwide and more specifically America. I'm going to show a clip in a moment, uh, the, opening, uh, the opening theme of the, of the show, which I think captures a little bit of the energy of, of the entire show and the beauty and the colors. Um, but you, you're, you're bringing up here this important point that it speaks, it manages to speak, it's very local, and yet manages to speak internationally. And I think this is the revolution of Israeli cinema. It's finding the local flavors and producing them on a on a high enough universal level that, that anyone can actually relate both on the human level, but also on the artistic level. Um, I'm gonna nerd out in the middle of the, uh, of the, um, of the, uh, I'll, I'll let us watch the um, opening in, in, uh, in full, and then I'm gonna nerd out and um, talk about one point in that uh, opening that I use constantly when we're teaching classes here um, as a symbol of what Israeli cinema is. Um, I wonder if you know what I'm thinking of. Um, just before I share it, what, what is, for those here who are not familiar, what is Florentine? How would you define Florentine? Oh, well, it's um, uh, th this, this neighborhood in downtown Tel Aviv, South Tel Aviv, um, in the, at the time was, was just starting to become a place which um, um, people were knowing, um, caring about, uh, with the years it, and, and the show, it became, as things go, gentrified and it's um, uh, wonderful today, full of uh, cafes, restaurants, pubs, whatever. I think it's still affordable. Um, parts of it are still affordable for young students, artists um, in, in Tel Aviv. Um, it's so, sort of a Tel Avivian village, you could say, um, or um, neighborhoods in Brooklyn today that are um, considered young and hip. So um, at the time that was the neighborhood to live in as a young young person, Tel Avivian or coming from outside of Tel Aviv to live in Tel Aviv. Yes. So let's watch a quick clip here as I attempt to share my screen. Rule number one of Zoom conversations is never show a movie. And that's what we're gonna do right now. We'll just show a quick clip. So bear with us, everybody. אמרה לי תראה, החיים די קלים. נזכור לנו חדר בדרום תל אביב, ונחיה כמו גדולים, ונחיה מדקה לדקה. נמצא עבודה זמנית לא רצינית, וגם נחתום בלשכה. אולי גם תמצא איזה נושא לכתיבה, לא משהו עמוק, משהו מתוק, סיפור אהבה, עם המון מטאפורות, עם המון דימויים. הגיבור יהיה שיכור, כמו שאתה בחיים, שאתה בחיים, שאתה בחיים, יש כאב יפה שעובר מהר. שאני רוצה לא להיזכר איך אני עמדתי שם איך אני אמרתי לה ככה את יפה זה מה שאת צריכה זה מה שאני רוצה וככה זה יהיה Um, I'm, <laughs> it, it was probably a little jumpy because of the, uh, because of the zoom, but not only it's also, um, it was, was shot and edited in, in a way that 
gave that kind of feel and I think uh, great energy, great, just great mm. colors, great use of- It's considered uh, very cool at the time uh, and, and different to shoot that way. Everything was handheld and kind of jumpy. Um, we were um, influenced by shows like NYT PD Blue that did that and, and, and yeah, and I think it was the right um, language, a cinematic language to, to, to show the, the story or to bring the story of these people in Florentine. Very, very nostalgic to see to see that, and <laughs> and and moving to, to see that we were so young and and cool. <laughs> um, I, I I was wondering how you were experiencing that because yes, I, I'd say for me too. I I'm, I'm watching that, and um, I, I should watch that every year. I should watch that opening because it's really um, you know shows all these people, and I I knew some of them, and there's there's. Uh, it's interesting to see where the, where some of these people are today and are not today, and um, and yeah, it's it's definitely captures a a a time and a place. Um, the moment in that for me that I that I use as a real symbol is uh, Karina Fear, in her when she's getting her credit, she's holding and and uh, something in her hand that most Americans will have no idea what it is. Um, and it's called in Hebrew for those familiar, anybody Israeli here definitely knows it. Um, anybody want to guess it, put it in the chat. Um, but it's uh, Shoko Besakit. Shoko Besakit is uh, literally chocolate milk in a bag. Um, she's, that's how chocolate milk came for kids in Israel. Um, it, for some reason here in America, it comes in little boxes, has been forever in, uh, in, in little, you know, containers, milk containers. In Israel, they come in a bag. Um, when, I, when I was growing up in Israel, all milk came in bags. Usually you had to fish one out of a, you know, one would open up. So it was in a smelly kind of crate of milk and you'd have to fish one out. And Shoko Besakit specifically, the, the chocolate milk were these um, small sized ones, you know, individually packaged and you'd bite the top off. That's the only way to open it. It wasn't one of those like, perforated tops. You had to bite it off, spit it out. You have to know how to spit it correctly. Otherwise you're, you're swallowing that little piece that you bit off. Um, and then you just drink it usually in one sip because you can't put it down anywhere. You, you, it's, it, this wasn't made for, uh, for easy use. Um, you take something that is so definitively Israeli, so specific, so hard to use. So, I mean, there's a lot of symbols here. Um, and she takes it, Karina Fear takes that and um, starts spraying it, which is one of the things you could do with one of the, the advantages of having your chocolate milk in a bag is that you could start chocolate milk wars with it and spray it at people and start spraying it in like kind of a rainbow. And create this beautiful moment out of the Israeli, out of something that is so Israeli and technically was probably never meant to be beautiful, it probably came out of a very non-artistic um, non space. That's a beautiful description, Isaac. I mean, really, really. I mean, a, a chocolate milk rainbow. Uh, and, and that is like a, a childhood memory of mine, drinking uh, a shoko besakit. Uh, we used to go to summer camps. Uh, where that's something that was um, given out to all the campers is uh, lachmania, a bun, and, <laughs> um, and choco bursaki, the chocolate milk in a bag, whatever you'd call it. Uh, yeah, another symbol, which I thought you were referring to, was, um, by the way, you were talking about all the dairy products, the milk and so on, very, very appropriate for Shavuot, I think. Do you in America have this thing where everyone eats dairy products for Shavuot? I think it's, it's part of the holiday. Yeah, everyone's obsessed in Israel with dairy products and the, there's these competitions of the best cheesecake in Israel, lists of the best cheesecake in Israel and newspapers and so on. Anyhow, the, the image I thought you might be referring to is the synagogue, this small synagogue in the middle of this... Um, crazy hip neighborhood with all these um, um, young people who are very fashionable and, and hip and all the cafes and um, suddenly it's uh, the character of Sami Huri Kobi uh, stands there and there's this little synagogue behind him in the midst of all of these things going on. I was in Florentine a few days ago to actually show Sublet in this small cool little theater that young people opened in Florentine and there's still that synagogue in the middle of 
this craziness of this very cool downtown neighborhood, this little synagogue, that's very Tel Avivian, I think. Uh, very Israeli, very Tel, Aviv, very Tel Avivian, I would say. It's, it's very interesting to see that there. And I think it also shows kind of the contrast of those different worlds. Um, and one of the other contrasts that I noticed now for the, uh, when I was watching it um, uh, actually to prep for the class for this event um, is um, you, I don't know if you, if you noticed this, but all the locals from Florentine that you're showing that were possibly taken in uh, documentary format, just on the people on the streets are elderly people. So it was the, the, the contrast in Florentine was not just that there's this like young hip artistic scene coming in to maybe a more industrial traditional neighborhood, but it's also the age differences and they're kind of the old, an old Tel Aviv while there's a new Tel Aviv coming in. Yes, and you're right. That's what we found there when we were walking down the streets of, of Florentine. We shot the, the people living there who were older, more traditional, religious, and what we were bringing in was younger, completely secular, uh, maybe more connected to the world at the time. People in Florentine, these young people really wanted to be people of the world. Um, Tel Aviv was, or as far as they're concerned, were, was London, Paris, New York, or that's what they wanted to be. There were songs that were, were, were created by the actors and singers that appeared in Florentine that was, what was the song? Chai uh, Florentine Cholem al New York City. I think that was the song. I mean, I, I live in Tel Aviv, but I dream of New York City. I think that was one of the theme songs of Florentine. Uh, so that, that, that whole thing of, I'm secular in Tel Aviv. There are religious things happening around me. I dream of possibly living one day or for a period of time in New York, in America. America's a big issue. Uh, yes. Um, so I will point out, and we'll come back to this, that I think that reflection of age differences and um, is something that has, so has been playing a part in your work, at least uh, the last few films. Um, I, was, I was the young, one of the young gang at the time. And now when, with Sublet, um, I represent an older generation. Yes. Now you're you're the locals walking around as the new kids coming in. Exactly. Um, your next big film after that that actually got a lot of international attention, and I, I don't know if you felt that that was a changing point for a turning point for you internationally. Though your films before that were successful, um, was Yossi and Jagger. Um, I, I chose that one as kind of like the name for this um, for this for this session because I thought it's also to the American audience. I think one of the more familiar. Um, uh, films. Um, I believe we have it actually playing on our streaming site. So it's one of those films that's available um, in the U.S. had full um, full distribution. Um, what what does that film mean for you? Uh, well, you know what? I su it suddenly I, rem I it occurred to me. I, I I I'm reminding myself that after Florentine, the whole business of Israel and America is a big issue in my life, being between Israel and, and America. And I remember after Florentine, I, I, was, I thought I was um, this big shot, successful Israeli um, television director, film director, and I should do the, the natural thing for any television or film director uh, worldwide is to move to um, Los Angeles and become an American TV or, or film director. Film was the big issue at the time. Uh, if you were ser a serious artist, you'd, you'd make film and not television. But, um, and, and I did move to New York, um, New York, LA for a year, 1998. And it was a very difficult experience for me. And experience, yeah, very difficult. And I, and I came back at the end of that year and, and kind of decided, okay, this American experience was not the best experience in the world. And, and I did not make it as an American television or film director. I'll come back to Israel, invest all my energy, artistic energy in um, becoming um, or making good television, good Israeli film. And, and then there was a string of, of films that I made one after the other that I feel um, pretty good about. And Yossi and Jagger was um, the first film that I made when I came back from the States. It started as a television film. Uh, it was supposed to be a 50 minute film. And then it was 
close to 70, which is still pretty short for a feature film. There was distributed theatrically worldwide. Uh, and it was a very in, important film for me, very personal. It did have my army experiences and in it and war experiences. Uh, and it had the whole um, sexual identity question, uh, the whole machismo that you were referring to before, what it meant to be an Israeli man, what I felt about what it meant to be an Israeli man, what was considered a proper Israeli man. I grew up in, a, in an Israeli world where Israeli men were supposed to be strong, tough, uh, become Israeli soldiers, perhaps become war heroes, um, that they were straight, of course, that came without saying. Uh, and I wanted to, to tell a story which was a different soldier army war story. And that's crucial for American audiences too, to see, to see Israeli soldiers who also definitely have that image um, internationally, um, to see, to see uh, I mean, it's probably the first time that we saw an Israeli soldier, um, two Israeli soldiers as gay men and, and what, what that did to the whole identity of the Israeli soldier at that time. Uh, yes, and you know that there was what was happening in the film, what was happening around it. When we came to the Israeli army to say, I, I came and said I wanted to make a film about the Israeli army, which at the time uh, you couldn't make an Israeli film about the Israeli army without the cooperation of Tzahal, the Israeli army. Mm -hmm. You needed their bases, their, um, their guns, their, um, yeah, their uniforms to shoot an Israeli film, very small, little Israeli film that needed any support, any help possible. And the Israeli army said, no, read the script. They said, we're not gonna support this kind of film. They knew at the time already that um, um, they had to be more politically correct when it came to, um, um, but then gay and lesbian today, LGBTQ, um, uh, I think, uh, um, community. Uh, they knew that they had to be a little more politically right. So they didn't say, no, we're gonna, not gonna support a gay film about the Israeli army. They said, we're not gonna support a film where their relationships between, I don't know, different rank, ranks in the army. I don't know how you say that, like a higher ranking officer and a lower ranking officer. That's impossible, that's improper. We're not gonna support that kind of film. When at the time there was this TV show called Tironut where there were all kinds of relationships going on, but between men and women male officers and their female soldiers and so on. So it was clear that they were uh, kind of using that as an excuse. Um, and then we, so we went, we went on and we continued and made this film on our own. The actors brought their uniforms from home. Every Israeli man almost has um, tucked under his bed or in the closet, a, a pair of, a, or a uniform, an Israeli army uniform. And we somehow shot the film very small. Uh, and it, and the army at the time did not like the film. But then the film came out and it did became this very big success in Israel, which was a thing to think about. How did this kind of film become such a success in Israel? And Israeli audiences were embracing the film. And then the army said, OK, we'll bring you over, Eitan, and, and have you show the film to soldiers, to a group of soldiers. There's this thing called Tabut Yom Rishon, Tabut Yom Aleph, which is Sunday. You know, Israelis start their week on Sunday and soldiers go back to their bases on Sunday. Before they go back to the um, difficult circumstances of being an Israeli soldier, they are given some kind of a culture uh, event, events. So as part of Tabut Yom Aleph, they were um, sent to a theater in Tel Aviv where they could see Yossi and Jack. And I see where they were entering the Tel Aviv Cinematheque and there was a big poster that seemed kind of gayish. And I saw them walking in, feeling uncomfortable with their gear and stuff like that. And then they were sitting in the theater and I felt this tension, maybe it was me projecting my tension, but about them watching such a film. And they were, what kind of film? They're making a lot of noise. As the films you know, went on, they were quiet. And by the end of the film, the, the lights came up and they were they were they were holding each other and crying. Okay, so so for me that was a very meaningful experience and a very important point in my in my career in my life. One came up to me and said, "You know what? 
this was it was this was a great experience. We almost forgot that they were gay. <laughs> Something like that. That today would of course be uh, uh, perceived as a bit very bad thing to say, not acceptable at the time. I really took that as a compliment from this tough young Israeli <laughs> soldier. This was so nice. We forgot that they were gay. <laughs> and that, no, it really became an important part part of my career. It kind of went into Israeli culture in different ways. When Israel left Gaza, and there was almost this civil war in Israel about leaving Gaza at the time, we withdraw, there was a withdrawal from, from Gaza. Um, okay, anyhow, the, these two men were running the show. A very important army officer and a very important um, commander in the Israeli police. They were supposed to make this happen in the most peaceful way possible without being, people being killed or you know, shot, um, as peaceful as possible. And they were chosen, you know, like in Time Magazine in Israel, they were chosen men of the year they, after this um, successful operation. They were chosen men of the year. They, they gave this very big interview in Mariv, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which was at the time an important newspaper in Israel. And, they, and the, the reporter asked, okay, forget about politics and the whole operation. Tell us something personal about how you felt and what was going on in your hearts when you were doing this. And then one of them described the following description, gave this following description. He said, we were standing there overlooking Gaza. It was, um, it was Friday, Shabbat was almost um, coming in. And we looked at, at Gaza and we realized that this was over. And we felt very good. We felt like, we felt like Yossi and Jack. Uh, it, 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 it makes me teary now that I think of it. I, I had to um, pinch myself, you know, uh, in order to, these two very tough Israeli men, um, an army officer, a policeman were saying, we felt like Yossi and Jagger. Now they, it, this doesn't mean that they felt gay. What it meant is we felt close to each other. We felt um, um, intimate with each other. It's two straight men, tough, straight men, uh, we felt close to each other. And he was referring or using Yossi and Jagger to, to express his feelings. So yeah, I felt, you know, I felt good. Fascinating. And once again, coming, coming full circle to where we are right now with, with, with everything and, and connecting that back in. Um, only because we're short for time, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead in your career. <laughs> Um, and of course, I, I can't not mention um, Walk on Water, which was, I think, also another pivotal moment. Um, I, I could tell you that it was the first American film in the first Israeli film in the American box office um, to be somewhat profitable. Um, I don't know if it was profitable, ultimately more than the costs of uh, filmmaking, but um, for an Israeli film to make over a million dollars in um, the American box office was unheard of at the time, except for um, uh, Salah Shabbati and a couple of others along <laughs> the way. Um, but this one really from, from the new era of Israeli cinema was, was a hit. Um, and, and an, an interesting film also stylistically, I'd say it was, I, we were talking about escapism before and some say that American cinema is more about escapism. And in some ways this film, you know, it was a, it's about a secret agent, a Mossad agent and, and all, this, uh, all, all this kind of uh, action world that, um, that it actually played, even though I think it has a lot of social elements in it, um, German Jewish relations and, and other um, themes that we've mentioned here before, um, it actually played very well for an American audience. Um, is that how it was perceived in Israel? Would... Yeah, the criticism about me in Israel, there's some film critics that um, do not like me <laughs> and, and those who do not like me um, claim that I'm too American whatever that means, I'm too American, or that I intentionally make films for the, for the American market or for Israeli American audiences. Um, that's certainly not the case. Maybe my films are more American because um, deep inside I am I'm partially um, American and grew up in an American family, American culture, the, the English language um, with Peter, Paul and Mary and Pete Seeger. 
Um, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, Walk on Water was, is my most successful film worldwide. It did make some money for the people um, who made it, which is of course something that doesn't happen a lot in film. Today in television, people are signing these wonderful deals with their Netflix, Amazon, Apple, and they do make money, which is amazing. I mean, for our small television film industry, people are actually making money, which is something that, you know, when I came out of film school, my parents, of course, were saying, and they were right. Film, being a film director was something in Israel was something you didn't do, do if you wanted to make money. You know, why don't you become a doctor or a lawyer or, or something where you can make a living? not a film director. And they were right at the time, but things have changed. And especially for people who make television today, they can really make a lot of money, which is wonderful. Yeah, um, yeah so um, walk on water. Walk on water. And then we, we, we just to, to get us updated, for those not following, um, the big, I guess, uh, next one was The Bubble, which I think um, took your interest in Tel Aviv. And it's probably your most overtly political film um, but uh, but brought uh, brought a lot of uh, those themes, both the politics and Tel Aviv life. Um, I, I think also somewhat to the mainstream, um, and that was followed up by um, the film Yossi, which was a, um, a a a kind of an interesting sequel. I don't know if you consider it a sequel, but uh, it's not a, a traditional sequel. But um, but follows Yossi from Yossi and Jagger. Um, when he's at a different stage in his life. Um, yeah, it is a sequel. Uh, usually art house films do not have sequels, but I, I really felt I, I left Yossi, the protagonist of Yossi and Jagger, in a very tough place where he lost his, his lover, Jagger, at war. And, and that was, of course, tragic within itself. But the fact that he is a gay soldier could not express the fact that this was his lover. This was his, his boyfriend, his lover. Uh, and, and he of course could not share that information with anyone. No one wanted to, he couldn't do that at the time. No one wanted to hear that at the time. Jagger's mother, of course, adapted this wonderful girl who happened to be there as Jagger's girlfriend. You were his girlfriend and so on. So um, the character of Yossi were left, was left very alone at the end of Yossi and Jagger. And I wanted to say, the world is changing. The world has changed. I want to introduce the new world to you. I want you to, to change with it. I, might, I want you to feel better about life. And so I, I kind of, I, I, I made that film, uh, which starts with a very depressed Yossi and ends with a, um, a more hopeful Yossi. Um, and I think is, is kind of also a more sensitive, I think your beat changes a little bit with this film and, um, and connects most directly and allows me to jump right into it um, since we, we got our 10 minute warning here um, to your latest film to Sublet. There, there were others on the way, there was Cupcakes, which you could see on our streaming site. I'll share in the chat in a moment, um, but Sublet is your latest film. And also once again, is connecting to Tel Aviv, to um, themes of aging and the world today. What, what inspired Sublet for you? Um, aging, maybe. The fact that I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not one of the kids in Florentine anymore. I'm 55. Aging was, of course, uh, something that I was experiencing and wanted to deal with. Having children, or in my case, not having children. Uh, a lot of issues. I, I use film as somewhat of a therapeutic um, 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 experience, a way of dealing with my different issues. Um, yes, so these things pile up. Um, uh, on my desks, um, so to speak, and I say, okay, now I have an, ex uh, an ex I have an opportunity to make a film or create a TV show, and I can deal with all these issues that have accumulated, and and they change, of course, the, the issues. Some of them don't change, and they're reoccurring themes and reoccurring things going on in my films, um, but yes. Um, aging, being between Israel and America, 
being between a, a, a more an, an older man and a younger man that I guess is still somewhere in me. Israel and America, as I said, uh, what it means to be an Israeli today and more specifically a Tel Avivian, a young Tel Avivian. Things have changed a lot since 1995 when we shot Florentine. Let, let me let me ask you. You mentioned this um, comparison, which I think is one of that th one of those themes um, in the film between American and Israeli cultures, and I think that's a, that's going to be a fascinating part for the American audience to really understand what those differences are. What were the differences for you when you clash those two characters together of an Israeli and American um, in Tel Aviv? I think the differences are not as extreme as they used to be. When I moved to Israel, I, I had to um, hide my American identity and my American parents for that matter. My mother, you can imagine my mother moving from Manhattan, 1967 to Jerusalem, the shtetl of Jerusalem. And, and I was ashamed of my mom. You know, I said, you know, my mom couldn't thought she had to leave her apartment in Jerusalem with her little uh, high heels, small black dress, white gloves, pearls, whatever. And, and, and I said, mom, pick me up two blocks away from school. You don't look like the other mothers. <laughs> I don't want you to pick me up at school. I'm ashamed of you and your American culture, your language, the fact that you couldn't speak Hebrew, um, the, the food you were preparing, macaroni and cheese, pancakes for breakfast. We didn't have hummus and tahini uh, in, in, our, in our kitchen like other um, friends of mine, Israeli friends of mine. I think that that's 19, late, late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s. I think that, that the differences are not as, as, as big and the dichotomy is not that anymore. I think Tel Aviv is, is, was very Americanized, it's very international, cosmopolitical. Uh, uh, so where are those differences, are differences today? <laughs> what? Where are those differences today? Now, now that Israel, Tel Aviv is, you know, one of the top international cities in the world, where do you see the differences between um, American culture and Israeli culture? And I think some of it does come up in, in the film. Americans are more PC. Um, maybe that's, that, that there's certain ways that you talk about things and other ways that you don't talk about things. And that Israelis have less, that the young Israelis who are very direct and, and sometimes, um, uh, talks in ways that you and I might not appreciate, but it's more the difference between an older man and a younger man. There are discussions about relationships, um, love, sex, family, um, different approaches between uh, older ma men or older people for that matter and younger people today. And I think that's true uh, worldwide, not necessarily in Israel, not necessarily when you um, introduce an American older man to an American, to an Israeli younger man. Uh, what are the differences? I don't think they're, 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 there are differences, yeah, but not too extreme. The, the, the differences are not too extreme. Um, let me, let me show the trailer yeah. from, uh, for the film. Yeah, the, Amer the American distributor just put out a trailer, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's yeah, I think yeah. Was your first public showing of it. Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Michael. I'm I'm subletting the apartment. So how's Tel Aviv? It's a kind of a strange mixture. I'm not sure I can figure it out. Who is that? My landlord. Oh my God, he's hot. Oh, stop. He could be his dad. But I'm not. So what's the pen? I write a column for the New York Times, The Intrepid Traveler. Let's turn it down a little bit. It's just a name, though. So you're not really intrepid? I try to be. I have a list. All those the must-sees? Yeah. If you are a Jewish princess on her birthright tour, yeah. Come. I will show you the best pomegranate juice in Tel Aviv. Do you have small change, maybe? Thanks. So you wrote a book once. What was it about? New York City in the late 80s, early 90s. It's so depressing. Why does everything always has to go back to that? 
Well, I didn't go back. I was there. I sort of wrote the book in real time. I'll be your home. I'll be your country. I'll be your northern star. Maybe you could show me around the city. I'll be your landscape. Israelis really try to be nice to tourists. They want to feed you. They want to tell you stories. Do you have children? We did try, my husband and I. Everything is possible now. I'm not so sure about that. You and David, you still have sex? We do occasionally have sex. Occasionally. Wow. I really don't get this. How is that any way to meet somebody? A quick way. No drama. <laughs> I hate to be the guy who says when I was your age. <laughs> <laughs> don't think it's too late for you. The idea is to see how much I can discover about a city. I'll be the note that holds the cord. I'll be a symphony. And what did you discover about Tel Aviv? It's unlike any other place I've visited. Beautiful film. Coming out in theaters, here's the plug once again. Coming out in theaters in June. We're going to have it as part of our Israel Film Center Festival at the end of June. Um, and it really, I think, I think um, is, it's fascinating to see your whole career, um, like watching this and watching Florentine, where there's so many connections and so much maturity um, in the work here that, um, that, that, that it's been a fascinating path. Um, what do you think about the should... trailer? Tell me what you think about the trailer because this is I, I've seen it before, but this is the first time I see it with an audience or with a, a group of, of, of people as part of a, a Tikkun Lel Shavuot. <laughs> um, what do you? I'll tell you, it, trailers are so, and I'm still, of course, it's a new film. I'm still very nervous about everything that has to do with it. So trailers today are so important. People decide if to go see a film or not go see a film based on its trailer and it's very difficult. It's, a, it's an art form that I, I know very little about. I, I don't think I'm a, if I had to do trailers, they wouldn't be that great or that seductive because you have to be very seductive with a, with a, a trailer and to take people, draw people into a, a, a theater. What you've seen the film, d d does it represent the film in a good way? Um, is it, is it uh, seductive enough? Will American audiences want to see the film after they see the trailer? And yeah, it's Tikkun Lel Shavuot, you have to be very honest and truthful with me. <laughs> I think that's one of the rules of Shavuot. Um, yeah. I, I saw some thumb, I'm seeing thumbs up, which is great. And, and, and I, I'll share that, that it has, you know, the beautiful music, it has um, emotion, um, but most importantly, it shows food. And I think that's one of the things that Tel Aviv really can um, highlight itself about. So um, I think that's, that's really captures it all. It's, it's beautifully shot and the colors are, are vivid and, you know, the people are beautiful. And most importantly, I'll say also seeing the film, um, it's emotional. And, and I think you, you'll feel, you, you feel that um, in this, in this uh, trailer. Um, Eitan, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again um, with Sublet as it's released here in the US. Folks, start telling your friends about the release. Um, Chag Sameach, thank you all so much for being with us. Check out some of Eitan's films on israelfilmcenterstream.org. I've placed them in the chat. And um, we'll see you all, we're here all night long. So please everyone join us for more programs.